Volume three, chapter thirteen of That Unfortunate Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume three, chapter thirteen. Mrs. Dormer Smith's affectionate letter to her brother produced a result which she had not at all anticipated when she wrote it. He arrived in England by the next steamboat from Ostend and took up his quarters in her house. He had come ostensibly for the purpose of visiting Combe Park and patching up a reconciliation with his uncle. This, indeed, was a pet scheme with Pauline. She had hinted at it in writing to her brother. Now that George and poor dear Lucius were gone, Lord Castlecombe might not dislike to be on good terms with his heir. He was old and lonely, and as Pauline's correspondence had assured her, greatly broken down by the death of his sons. Frederick scarcely knew which to regret the most— his niece's departure, or his brother-in-law's arrival. He missed May very much, but very shortly he began to be reconciled to her engagement. Rivers was a gentleman and an honest fellow, and might be trusted to take care of May's money, which Mr. Dormersmith thought would otherwise be in imminent jeopardy from the arrival on the scene of May's papa. That gentleman, indeed, who had at first taken the news of his daughter's engagement with supreme indifference, showed some lively symptoms of disapprobation on learning the fact of Lucius's bequest. A daughter dependent on the bounty of Mrs. Dobbs for food, shelter, and raiment was an uninteresting person enough, but a daughter who possessed between four and five hundred a year of her own ought not to be allowed to marry without her father's consent. Frederick dryly remarked that May's capital was stringently tied up in the hands of trustees, whether she were married or single, whereupon Augustus indulged in very strong language respecting his dead cousin and declared that the terms of the will were a pointed and intentional insult to him, who was his child's natural guardian. Still, although the capital was secure, Frederick knew that the income was not, and the more he observed his brother-in-law, the more he felt how desirable it was that May should have a husband to take care of her. Captain Cheffington had not improved during his years of exile. He smoked all day long, and even at night in his bed, incensing May's chamber, which he occupied with clouds of tobacco smoke. He had contracted other unpleasant habits, and his temper was diabolical. He had not brought his wife to England with him. He would sit for hours with his slippered feet on the fender in his sister's dressing room, railing at the absent Mrs. Augustus Cheffington in a way which was most grievous to Pauline, for he showed not the least reticence in the presence of Smithson. Talk of floating! How would it be possible to float a woman of whom her own husband spoke in that way? He had no very grave charges to bring against La Bianca, after all. She had been faithful to him, and stuck to him, and worked for him, but he bewailed his fate in having tied himself to a third-rate Italian opera singer without an idea in her head beyond painting her face and squalling. It was just his cursed luck. Why couldn't Lucius die, since he meant to die, six months earlier? At another time he would openly rejoice in the death of his cousins, and express a fervent hope that the old boy wasn't going to last much longer. Pauline would remonstrate, and put her handkerchief to her eyes, and beg her brother not to speak so heartlessly of his own family, especially of poor dear Lucius. But Augustus pooh-poohed this as confounded humbug. He was uncommonly glad to be the heir of Combe Park, and thought it about time that his family, and his country, and the human race generally, made him some amends for the years he had passed under a cloud. He would show them how to enjoy life when he came into possession of his property, as he had taken to call Lord Castlecombe's estate. He planned out several changes in the disposal of the land, and decided what rent he would take for the house and home park, for he did not intend to live in this damned foggy little island, where one had bronchitis if one hadn't got rheumatism, and rheumatism if one hadn't got bronchitis. In one respect, his visions coincided with his sister's, since he talked of having a villa on the Mediterranean coast, not far from Monte Carlo, but they differed from hers in several important points, notably in providing no place for her in the villa. Frederick would sometimes throw a shade over these rosy dreams by observing doggedly that for his part he doubted the likelihood of Lord Castlecombe's speedy decease, and that looking at them both he was inclined to consider Uncle George's life the better of the two, so that on the whole domestic life in Mr. Dormer Smith's smart house at Kensington was by no means harmonious. Meanwhile Pauline, with considerable pains and earnest meditation, composed a letter to her uncle on behalf of Augustus. She did not venture to entrust the task to Augustus himself. It would be impossible to persuade him to be as smooth and conciliatory as the case demanded. But she wrote a letter which, she thought, combined diplomacy with pathos, and from which she hoped for some satisfactory result. 
but the reply she received by return of post was of such a nature that she hastily thrust it into the fire lest augustus should see it and told him and her husband that poor dear uncle george was not yet equal to the effort of seeing augustus after the great shock he had suffered uncle george had in fact stated in the plainest terms that if captain cheffington ventured to show himself in combe park the servants had orders to turn him out forcibly the object for which captain cheffington had come to england at that time being thus balked it would have appeared natural that he should return to his wife in brussels but day followed day until nearly three weeks had elapsed since lucius cheffington's death and still augustus remained at kensington every morning with a dreadful regularity mr dormer smith inquired of his wife if she knew whether her brother were going away in the course of that day and every morning the shower of tears with which mrs dormer smith received the inquiry and which generally formed her only answer to it became more copious augustus on the whole was the least uncomfortable of the trio he had contrived to raise a little ready money on his expectations he was well lodged and well fed the change to london now that he had a few pounds in his pocket was not unwelcome after brussels and as to his brother-in-law's undisguised dislike to his presence he had grown far too callous to heed it so long as it suited him to ignore it not but that he took note of it in his mind keenly enough and promised himself the pleasure of paying off frederick with interest as soon as he should come into his property all this time a humble household in oldchester was a great deal happier than the wintry days were long the news of captain cheffington's arrival in england had at first disturbed may perhaps he might insist on seeing her and she shrank from seeing him but she thought it her duty to write to him and inform him herself of her engagement and neither owen nor her grandmother opposed her doing so if may had any lingering illusions about her father or any hope that he would manifest some gleam of parental tenderness towards her the illusion and the hope were short-lived the reply to her communications was a hurried scrawl haughtily regretting that mr owen rivers had not thought proper to wait upon him and ask his consent to the marriage which he totally disapproved of and adding that although rivers of riversmead was undoubtedly good blood it appeared that the traditions of gentlemanlike behaviour had been lost by the present bearer of the name since he had entered the service of a tradesman the letter ended with a peremptory demand for fifty pounds may and owen had planned that granny was to return to friars row on their marriage mr bragg was willing to break the lease which he held and to remove his office to another house hard by and mrs dobbs with all her goods and chattels was to be reinstated in her old home as this scheme was to be kept secret from granny for the present it involved a vast deal of delightful mystery and plotting joe weatherhead was admitted to the conspiracy and enjoyed it with the keenest relish a word or two had been said as to mrs dobbs taking up her abode with the young couple when they should be married but this granny insistently and inflexibly refused no no children i'm not quite so foolish as that it's very well for owen to take may for better for worse but it would be a little too much to take may and her grandmother for better for worse of course it was not long before owen took his betrothed to see canon and mrs hadlow they walked together to the old house in college quad where however their news had preceded them the hadlows were very cordial both of them were very fond of may and aunt jane loudly hoped that owen appreciated his good fortune and declared it was far above his deserts though in her heart she thought no girl in england too good for her favourite nephew the lovers were affectionately bidden to come again as often as they could and brighten up the old place with the sight of their happy young faces they agreed as they walked home together that the home in college quad seemed a little gloomy and lonely without connie connie was still away she had only been at home on a flying visit of a few days during several months past she was now staying with a lady belcraft who had a handsome house at combe st mildred's mrs hadlow had told them so and a word or two uttered in the same breath about theodore bransby being often in that neighbourhood suggested a suspicion that theodore might be thinking of returning to his old love this idea annoyed owen extremely the hint which suggested it had been dropped almost in the moment of saying good-bye to mrs hadlow or he would have attempted at once to sound her on the subject he had interrogated his aunt privately while may was being petted and made much of by the kind old canon as to a rumour which was rife in oldchester namely that constance had been betrothed to lucius cheffington but aunt jane positively denied this she admitted that the gossip had reached her own ears and that she had spoken to her daughter about it but connie entirely disabused me of any such notion she said that in the first place nothing was farther from lucius's thoughts than love-making and that in the second place it would have been a most imprudent marriage for her 
since she could only expect to be speedily left a widow with a very slender jointure. Connie was never romantic, you know, said Aunt Jane, with a quick, half-humorous glance at her nephew. Owen began to consider with himself whether it might not be his duty to acquaint Canon Hadlow with many parts of Theodore's conduct, which were certainly unknown to him. All inquiries conducted either by himself or by Joe Weatherhead, who ferreted out information with untiring zeal and delight in the task, showed more and more plainly that the calumnies concerning Mrs. Bransby could be traced for the most part to her stepson, and in no single instance beyond him. May had long ago acquitted Constance Hadlow of speaking or writing evil things of the widow. Constance had not, in fact, expended any attention whatever on the Bransby family since their departure from Oldchester. She was spending her time very agreeably. Her hostess, Lady Belcraft, was a widow. She was a great crony of Mrs. Griffin's, and delighted with Mrs. Griffin's protégé. Having, so to speak, retired from business on her own account, her two daughters being married and settled long ago, Lady Belcraft was still most willing to renew the toils of the chase on behalf of a friend. She and Mrs. Griffin had carefully examined the county list of possible matches for Constance Hadlow, and had agreed that there was good hope of a speedy find, a capital run, and a successful finish. It so happened that on the same afternoon, when May and Owen were paying their visit to College Quad, Theodore Bransby was making a call at the residence of Lady Belcraft in Combe St. Mildred's. Ever since his interview with Mrs. Dobbs, now several days ago, Theodore had been considering his own case with minute and concentrated attention. We are, all of us, it must be owned, supremely interesting to ourselves, but Theodore's interest in himself was of a jealously exclusive kind. His health was undoubtedly delicate. He had felt the loss of a home to which he could repair when he was ailing or out of sorts ever since his father's death. He found, too, that he was apt to become hipped and nervous when alone. He came to the conclusion that he needed a wife to take care of him, and after grave consideration, he resolved to marry Constance Hadlow. If he could by a word have destroyed Rivers and obtained possession of May Cheffington, he would have said that word without hesitation or remorse. But since that could not be, he did not intend to wear the willow. He would marry Constance. That she would have accepted him long ago, he was well assured. And his circumstances were far more prosperous now than in those days. Cannon and Mrs. Hadlow could not but be impressed by his disinterestedness in coming forward now that he was in the enjoyment of a handsome independence and, on his side, he believed he was choosing prudently. If he were ill, the attentions of a wife, a refined and cultured woman, dependent, moreover, on him for the comfort of her daily life, would be far preferable to those of a hireling nurse, who would have the power of going away whenever she found her position disagreeable. But this was only one side of the question. When he grew stronger, he always looked forward to growing stronger, Constance would be an admirable helpmate from a social point of view. She had acquired influential friends, was received in the best houses, and would do his taste infinite credit, and whether as a politician or a barrister, she might have it in her power to forward his ambitions. It was as the result of these meditations that he called at Lady Belcraft's. He had met her occasionally in society, and she knew perfectly who he was, but there was a distinct film of ice over the politeness with which she received him when he was ushered into her drawing-room. She thought this little attorney's son was taking something like a liberty in appearing there uninvited, she forgave him, however, immediately, when in his most correct manner he asked for Miss Hadlow. Really, it might do, thought Lady Belcraft. The young man was very well off and presentable and all that, and dear Connie, though simply charming, had not a penny in the world. Neither was dear Connie her ladyship's own daughter. Yes, she positively thought it might do. She was so sorry that Miss Hadlow was not within, but she expected her every moment. She was walking, she believed, in the park. The park at Combe St. Mildred's meant Combe Park. Oh, yes, she was aware that Mr. Bransby was an old acquaintance. Playfellows from childhood, really, that sort of thing always has such a hold on one, was so extremely... Oh, there was dear Connie coming up the drive. Lady Belcraft sent a message by a servant, begging Miss Hadlow to come to the drawing-room, where she presently appeared. She was dressed in a winter toilet of carefully studied simplicity, and looked radiantly handsome. Theodore gazed at her as if he had never seen her before. Self-possessed, she had always been but she had now acquired something more than that, an air of conscious distinction, of being somebody, as Theodore phrased it in his own mind, which he admired and wondered at. "'Here's an old friend of yours, Connie,' said Lady Belcraft. Constance had been pulling off her gloves as she entered the room, and she now extended a white, well-cared-for hand to Theodore with a cool little, "'Oh, how do you do?' and the faintest of smiles.' 
Her hostess thought within herself that if there really was anything between her and young Bransby, Connie's behavior was marvellous, and that all the training bestowed on her own daughters had left them far below the point of finish attained by this provincial clergyman's daughter. "'Did you walk far? Are you tired?' she asked. "'No, thanks, dear Lady Belcraft. I'm not at all tired. I went to my favourite group of beaches. It's a capital day for walking. And what is the news in Old Chester, Theodore?' Her calling him Theodore in the old familiar way seemed to have the mysterious effect of putting him under her feet. It implied such superiority and security. Theodore was conscious of this, but it did not displease him. She had doubtless resented his not making the expected offer earlier. He had thought when he met her in London that hurt amour propre had much more to do with her cavalier treatment of him, but he had a charm to smooth her ruffled plumes. After a little commonplace conversation, Lady Belcraft recollected some orders which she wanted to give personally to her gardener, and with a brief excuse left the room. Constance perfectly understood why she had done so. Theodore did not, but he seized the occasion which he imagined Hazard had thrown in his way. "'I am very glad of this opportunity of speaking with you alone, Constance,' he began very solemnly. There was no trepidation such as he had felt in speaking to May. He neither trembled nor stammered nor grew hot and cold by turns. That chapter was closed. He was turning over a new and quite different leaf. "'Yes,' said Constance. "'Really?' She removed her hat, smoothed the thick dark braids of her hair before a mirror, and sat down with graceful composure. "'I don't think we have met, Constance, since—' He glanced at his black clothes. "'No, I think not. I was very sorry. I begged Mamma to give you a message from me when she wrote to condole with Mrs. Bransby. "'I merely allude to that sad subject in order to assure you that I am not unmindful of what is proper and becoming under the circumstances, and lest you should think me guilty of heartless precipitation.' He was beginning to enjoy the rounding off of his sentences, a pleasure he had never tasted in May's company, strong emotion being unfavorable to polished periods. "'Oh, I don't think you are ever guilty of precipitation,' answered Constance quietly, but the mirror opposite reflected a flash of her handsome eyes. "'Nothing,' continued Theodore, "'could be in worse taste than to neglect the accustomed forms of respect.' A period of twelve months would not be too long to mourn for a parent, so excellent as my father, but six months could not be considered to outrage decorum, and I should not urge... He paused. He had been on the point of saying that he would not press for the marriage taking place before the summer, when he happily remembered that he had not yet gone through the form of asking Constance whether she would marry him or not. To him it seemed so like merely taking up the thread of a story temporarily interrupted that he had lost sight of the probability that Constance's mind had not been keeping pace with his own on the subject. But it recurred to him in time. Constance was sitting on a low couch near the fireside at some distance from him. He now took his place beside her. There was a certain awkwardness in making a proposal of marriage across a spacious room. "'There can be no need of many words between us, Constance,' he began, with as much tenderness of manner as he could call up. Then he stopped. Constance had drawn away the skirt of her gown on the side next to him and was examining it attentively. "'What is the matter?' he asked. "'I thought you would accidentally set your boot on the hem of my frock,' she said, "'and the roads are so muddy, I thought, although it is fine overhead. "'But it's all right. I beg your pardon. You were saying?' This interruption was disconcerting. He had had in his head an elaborate sentence, which was now dispersed and irrecoverable. He must begin it all over again. However, when fairly started once more, his eloquence did not fail him. He offered his hand and fortune to Miss Hadlow in good set terms. She was silent when he had finished, and he ventured to take her hand. "'Am I not to have an answer, dearest Constance?' he asked. She drew her hand away very gently, with perfect composure, before saying, as she looked full at him with her fine dark eyes, "'You are not joking, then?' "'Joking? Well, I know you are not giving to joking, and this would certainly be an inconceivably bad joke, but it is almost more inconceivable that you should be in earnest.' He was fairly bewildered and doubtful of her meaning. "'However,' she continued, "'if you really expect a serious answer, you must have it. No, thank you.' He stood up erect and stiff, as if moved by a spring. She remained leaning back in an easy attitude on the couch and looking at him. "'I... Constance, I don't understand you!' he exclaimed. "'I refuse you,' she replied in a gentle voice and with her best society drawl. "'Distinctly, decidedly, and unhesitatingly, I think you must understand that.' 
"'Won't you stay and see Lady Belcraft? Theodore had taken up his hat and was moving towards the door. "'Oh, very well. I will make your excuses.' She rang the bell, which was within reach of her hand, and Theodore walked out of the room without proffering another word. End of chapter 13volume three chapter fourteen of that unfortunate marriage this librivox recording is in the public domain that unfortunate marriage by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter fourteen canon hadlow had resolved that his daughter when she returned to oldchester for may's wedding to which she was of course invited should remain in her own home at least for some months he had grown very discontented with her prolonged and frequent absences mrs hadlow at the earnest request of constance backed by a polite invitation from lady belcraft went to combe st mildred's to remain there one day and bring her daughter back with her but instead of doing so she sent a telegram home desiring that a box of clothes might be packed and sent to her and most surprising of all the box was to be addressed to dover this item of news was disseminated by the hadlow's servants whose duty it was to see the trunk conveyed to the railway station and the woman declared she believed from what she could make out that her mistress was going to france of course the canon knew the truth but the canon was not visible to callers he had a cold and kept his room all the circle of the hadlow's acquaintances and the circle seemed to be immediately widened by the dropping into its midst of this puzzling bit of news as a stone dropped into water is surrounded by a ring of ever-increasing circumference were however spared further conjecture by the publication in due course of the supplement to the times newspaper of tuesday the twenty seventh of february it contained the announcement of the marriage at the british embassy in paris on the preceding saturday of viscount castlecombe to constance jane only daughter of the rev edward hadlow canon of oldchester the general public or as much of it as had ever heard of the parties concerned for that vast entity the general public is really as divisible as a jellyfish each portion being perfect for all purposes of its existence when cut off from the rest was ranged as is usual in such cases in two main camps those who couldn't have believed it beforehand though an angel from heaven had denounced it and those who had all along had their suspicions and were not so very much surprised as you expected but only the nearest friends and relatives of the family enjoyed the not inconsiderable advantage for judging the matter of really knowing anything about it owen was the first person whom his uncle admitted to see him the old man was greatly overcome his daughter's marriage was a blow to him it gave a rude shock to the ideal constance whom he had loved and admired with a sort of delicate paternal chivalry there could be no question of love in such a marriage as this no question even of gratitude or reverence or any of the finer feelings to the pure-hearted simple-minded old man it seemed to be a sad degradation for his daughter not a soul except his wife ever fully understood his state of mind on the subject for he spoke of it to no one mrs dobbs perhaps came nearest to doing so she had a great reverence and admiration for the canon and considerable sympathetic insight into his feelings and when afterwards people said in her presence how proud and elated canon hadlow must be at his daughter's making so great a match she would tighten her lips and observe sotto voce that you might as well expect a christian saint to be gratified by being decorated with the peacock's feather of a chinese mandarin when mrs hadlow came home of course more particulars were divulged many came out by degrees in confidential talks with her nephew mrs hadlow spoke to him quite openly constance had earnestly begged her mother to go to her at combe st mildred's and almost immediately on her arrival there had announced that she was about to marry lord castlecombe and that everything was arranged for the ceremony to take place in paris since under the circumstances they both felt that it could not be managed too quietly she much wished her mother and father to accompany her to paris in order that everything might be en règle when the first astonishment was over mrs hadlow impulsively tried to dissuade her daughter from taking this step it was dreadful it was really monstrous to think of her connie marrying that old man who was several years the senior of her own father a man too of a hard unamiable character one who was much feared little respected and loved not at all she was revolted by the idea and as to the canon she could not bear to think of what he would feel he would never allow it it was hopeless to think of gaining his consent when her mother's tearful excitement had somewhat subsided constance pointed out that she had a very sincere regard for lord castlecombe who had behaved in every way excellently towards her and that as to falling in love as depicted by poets and novelists 
she had her private opinion which was briefly that all that was about as historically true as the adventures of oberon and titania and that at all events she was sufficiently acquainted with her own character to be persuaded that she was incapable of that species of temporary insanity further with regard to her father's consent she deeply regretted to hear that he was likely to withhold it since she would in that case be compelled to marry without it which would be very painful to her and when she said that it would be painful to her her mother knew that she spoke quite sincerely she was of full age to judge for herself in the matter and could not think of breaking her word to lord castlecombe she further pointed out that although of course oldchester people would chatter about her she spoke already as though she were looking down on those common mortals from the serene and luminous elevation of some fixed star yet there could be nothing scandalous said if she were known to be accompanied to paris by her mother as to papa his health and his duties and many other excuses might be alleged for his not undertaking a journey at that inclement season constance spoke with perfect calmness and without the slightest disrespect of manner but mrs hadlow was made aware within five minutes that nothing on earth which she had power to say or do would for an instant shake her daughter's resolve to be a viscountess there was nothing to be done but to put the best face possible on the matter and go to paris she could not allow her child to travel thither alone the bridegroom had already preceded them to make all needful preparations poor mrs hadlow was in such a whirl of confusion and emotion as scarcely to know what she was doing or saying had lady belcraft known of this she asked constance smiled rather scornfully as she replied that nobody would be more surprised than poor dear lady belcraft when she should learn the news no connie was not going to share the glory of her capture with any one and in truth such glory as belonged to it was all her own mrs griffin on hearing the news was at first half inclined to be sharp and spiteful at being kept in the dark although of course she did not allow herself to continue in that vulgar frame of mind but lady belcraft was subdued and almost prostrate in spirit before this gifted young creature she's a wonderful young woman my dear a wonderful young woman declared lady belcraft just before they landed from the steamboat at calais constance said to her mother mamma i do think you and papa are the most unworldly people i ever heard of you have never thought of saying a single word about settlements mrs hadlow started and looked blankly at her daughter she stood rebuked i have felt ever since you told me as if i had received a stunning blow on the head which deprived me of half of my faculties she answered but i ought to have thought of that it is not too late now perhaps to secure some provision for you is it connie i should not have thought of marrying lord castlecombe without a proper settlement mamma we might have been married a fortnight ago if it had not been for the delays of the lawyers although matters were simplified for them by my having nothing at all i am quite satisfied with the arrangements and i hope you and papa will be so too i think you will admit that lord castlecombe has been very generous mrs hadlow was a woman of bright intelligence and she had been apt to consider connie a little below the river's standard of brains but now as she looked and listened she felt tempted to exclaim like lady belcraft that this was a wonderful young woman but what words can paint the effect of that fateful announcement in the times on the family party assembled in mrs dormersmith's house at kensington augustus behaved so outrageously used such vituperative language and comported himself altogether with such violence that his brother-in-law privately fortified himself by securing the presence of a policeman well in view of the windows on the opposite side of the way before requesting captain cheffington to withdraw at once from his house much to his surprise and immensely to his relief the request was complied with promptly captain cheffington disappeared in a handsome cab with a smart travelling bag and followed by a second vehicle containing two well-filled portmanteaus whereas as james cynically remarked to the cook a cigar case and a toothpick was about the amount of his luggage when he arrived james had not been feed augustus asserted his claim to be considered one of the family by swearing at the servants and never giving any of them a sixpence the explanation of this speedy departure was shortly forthcoming in the shape of a variety of bills which poured in with astonishing rapidity augustus also as has been stated had been clever enough to raise a little money on the strength of his airship and mr dormer smith had to endure some contumely from creditors who had looked to getting something like twenty five per cent above market prices out of the captain and were roused to a frenzy of moral indignation when they discovered that he was safe out of england and beyond their reach 
to pauline the blow was the more severe because she persuaded herself that she had been the victim of black ingratitude on the part of constance that girl she would murmur weeping that girl whom i upheld as a mortal and who really did behave perfectly when she was here quite perfectly to think of that girl being the one to turn round on the family in this treacherous way i do not know how i shall endure to see her face again then don't see it suggested frederick if you think she has behaved so badly cut her and have done with it cut her exclaimed pauline sitting up from among the pillows in her chaise lounge with a vinaigrette in one hand and a pocket handkerchief in the other how can i cut my uncle's wife she is now lady castlecombe frederick you seem to have no idea that private feelings must give way to the duty one owes to society i wonder who will present her i dare say mrs griffin will persuade the duchess to do it it would not surprise me at all probably they will open the town-house now and come up every season cut her frederick you talk like that nihilist who is going to marry poor darling may frederick more than ever thought that poor darling may was to be congratulated on having secured the love and protection of the honest young englishman to whom his wife persisted in attributing anarchical principles he wrote a kind letter in which he proposed to come down to oldchester and give his niece away at the marriage if that would be agreeable to her and mr rivers may's affectionate heart was overjoyed by this proposal a joint letter signed by may and owen was sent by return of post in which both aunt pauline and uncle frederick were warmly invited to the wedding and may put in a special petition that harold and wilfred should be allowed to be present granny would find a nook for them in jessamine cottage may also sent an invitation to mrs bransby to be present but she replied that she would not bring her black gown to be a blot on their brightness but that no more loving prayers would be breathed for their happiness than those of their affectionate friend louisa bransby neither did aunt pauline accept the invitation she did not write unkindly her reply seemed to be indeed a sort of homily on the text how all unconscious of their doom the little victims play it was a sad business but she was mildly compassionate and forbearing but the best of all was that harold and wilfred were to be permitted to come in fact their father insisted on bringing them to their inexpressible rapture they took to granny at once and she had to keep a watch upon her tongue lest she should let slip before mr dormersmith the words she had said on first seeing the children poor dear motherless little fellows on the wedding morning a letter arrived from mrs dobbs from mr bragg mr bragg was about to sail for buenos aires on a twelve months visit to his son before going away he thought it would be agreeable to may and her husband he wrote to be the means of communicating something to mrs bransby which he hoped would be to her advantage the new premises which he had taken for his office now removed from friars row were to be furnished throughout and a couple of rooms reserved for mr bragg's use whenever he wished to come to oldchester from his country house under these circumstances a resident housekeeper would be required to look after the place and govern the servants mr bragg hoped that mrs bransby would do him the favour to accept this post and that she would find herself more comfortable among her old friends in oldchester than in the wilderness of london moreover he enclosed a cheque for a handsome sum of money as to the disposal of which he thus wrote the cheque i would ask mr rivers to apply in paying young martin bransby's school fees for the ensuing year and any little matter that may be over can be used for the boy's books and so on he is a fine boy i think and worth helping learning is a great thing i never had it myself but i don't undervalue it for that i have thought that this would perhaps be the best way i could find of what you might call testifying my appreciation of mr rivers services to me i hope he will accept it as a wedding present to may he sent no gift i could offer her nothing but dross he wrote and i don't want her thoughts of me to be mixed up with gold and diamonds and such poor things as are oftentimes the best a rich man has to give some young ladies would be disappointed at this i don't believe she will when she's dressed and ready to go to church just you please kiss her forehead with a blessing in your mind and you needn't say anything to her but just say to yourself this is from joshua bragg of the wedding it may be said that although it was no doubt in many respects like other weddings yet in several it was peculiar and its peculiarities were in such flagrant violation of the regulations of society that it was almost providential mrs dormersmith escaped witnessing it in the first place although uncle frederick was present 
a welcome and an honoured guest, May insisted that Mr. Weatherhead should give her away, and perhaps nothing she had ever done in her life had caused Granny more heartfelt satisfaction. As to Uncle Joe, the honour nearly overpowered him. His appearance in wedding garments, with an enormous white waistcoat and a bright rose-coloured tie, was an abiding joy to all the little boys of the neighbourhood who were lucky enough to behold him. Then the Miss Pipers fluttered into the church in such extremely bridal attire with long white veils attached to their bonnets as utterly to eclipse May in her quiet travelling dress. May, however, wore two ornaments of considerable value, a pearl bracelet and brooch, which had arrived the previous evening. Inside each Morocco case had been found a slip of paper bearing respectively the inscriptions To Miranda Cheffington with the good wishes of her great uncle and to dear may with the love of her affectionate friend constance castlecombe lastly amelia simpson was so florid in her raiment and so exuberant in her delight as to be the observed of all observers in her excitement she backed heavily upon people behind her and trod upon the gowns of people before her knelt down at the wrong moment and then discovering her mistake jumped up again at the very instant when the rest of the congregation were sinking on to their knees dropped her metal clasped prayer book with a crash in a solemn pause of silence lost her pocket-handkerchief, and, in her near-sightedness and confusion, seized on Miss Polly Piper's long white veil to wipe her tear-dimmed spectacles, and was altogether a severe trial to the nerves of the officiating clergyman. Many other friends were there. Major Mitten, with his amiable face and erect soldierly figure. Dr. Hatch, who said he doubted whether he could snatch a moment to witness the ceremony, but who remained to the very last to wish the young couple Godspeed when they drove away from the door of the church on their honeymoon trip. Even Sebastian Bach Simpson was in a softened mood. The entire absence of pretension about the whole affair conciliated his goodwill, and he played Mendelssohn's wedding march as a voluntary when the bride and bridegroom walked down the church arm in arm with unusual spirit and heartiness. And so May and Owen began their voyage of life together, followed by many good wishes, and by less of envy, hatred, malice, and uncharitableness, then perhaps fall to the lot of most mortals. Marriage, which is the end of most story books, is but the beginning of many stories, but this chronicle cannot follow the personages who have figured in it much beyond that fateful chapter of the wedding day. One or two facts may, however, be told, and a few outlines sketched in to indicate the course of future events on a more or less distant horizon. For a long time, Pauline clung, with the soft pertinacity which was part of her character, to the hope that poor dear Augustus might yet inherit the Castlecombe acres and resume his place in society. Uncle George could not live forever, but one fine day the bells of Combe St. Mildred's rang a merry peal, and the news spread like wildfire through the village that an heir was born in a foreign city called Naples, and that my lord and my lady, who was doing extremely well, and the all-important baby, were coming home to Combe Park as soon as ever my lady was strong enough to travel. Then, indeed, Pauline felt that Providence had decided against her brother, and that her own duty to society lay plain and clear before her. During the following year or two, she suffered considerable persecution in the shape of appeals for money from Augustus. The first were in a haughty strain, but before long they sank into the whine of the regular begging letter-writer, she gave him what she could, for to the last she had a soft place in her heart for her brother. But her husband, finding the case hopeless, forbade her to give any more, and as far as he could, prevented Augustus's letters from reaching her. Captain Chevington then brought his wife to London. He had little fear of his creditors, having by this time sunk so low as not to be worth powder and shot. He got his wife engaged, under her real name, at a music hall of the third class, and caused paragraphs to be inserted in sundry sporting and theatrical prints, to the effect that the Mrs. Augustus Cheffington, whose Italian bravura singing was so successful a feature in the nightly entertainment, etc., etc., was the niece by marriage of a peer of the realm, Viscount Castlecombe of Combe Park, and he furnished his relations liberally with copies of these papers. Probably he had some hope that they would buy him off to save the honour of the family. But in this he was totally at fault. The old lord, who in the joy of his little son's birth seemed to have taken a new lease of life, merely chuckled at Gus's making such a confounded ass of himself, and cared not a snap of the fingers for anything he could do or say. Owen Rivers privately supplied his father-in-law with all the necessaries and some of the comforts of life, on condition that he was never to annoy May by making any kind of appeal to her. On the first infringement of this condition, the supplies would be withdrawn. 
and in order to secure its not being all lost at the gaming table owen paid the money into the hands of la bianca who according to her lights was by no means a bad wife and was certainly a much better one than her selfish and graceless husband deserved mrs bransby gratefully accepted the position offered to her and fulfilled its duties entirely to mr bragg's satisfaction indeed when the latter returned from buenos aires he took the habit of spending a good deal of time in the apartment reserved for him over the office the house one of the roomy old-fashioned mansions in friars row contained ample accommodation for mrs bransby's family miss enid completed and maintained her conquest of mr bragg and some persons thought that it was this young lady's personal attractions which caused him to spend so much of his time in friars row but other observers thought differently and indeed quite laterally mrs dormer smith has had her ill opinion of mrs bransby strengthened by certain rumours touching the likelihood of that lady's promotion to a higher position in mr bragg's household than that of paid housekeeper if that should ever come off says mrs dormer smith i suppose poor dear foolish may's eyes will be opened at last and she may repent when it is too late having thrown away her magnificent opportunity to be picked up by that designing woman when these mysterious forecasts are imparted to lady castlecombe she only smiles faintly and says in her quiet well-bred way well but why not my lady has her own views on the subject views in which the discomfiture and mortification of theodore bransby form a conspicuous and pleasing feature but hitherto nothing has happened to justify the provisions of either lady on this score theodore is not often seen in oldchester now the place is full of disagreeable associations for him his political candidature was a failure the castlecombe influence on his behalf having been suddenly withdrawn after his lordship's marriage greatly to the perplexity of his lordship's agent nevertheless mr theodore bransby by no means despairs of being able to write m p after his name at some future time but if he ever does enter parliament it will probably be on what our continental neighbours term the extreme left of the chamber for theodore's political opinions have undergone a great revulsion and he is now loftily contemptuous of the territorial aristocracy in fact he has been heard to support advanced theories of an almost communistic complexion stopping short however at the confiscation of other people's property and maintaining the inviolability of government stock of which he is a large holder this sort of theory he finds to be quite compatible with the pursuit of fashionable society although surrounded by every luxury which can minister to his personal comfort he is not at all extravagant and indeed saves more than half his annual income this he does not from positive avarice but because he feels ever more and more strongly that money is power moreover it will be well to have a handsome sum in hand whenever he marries for he is still firmly minded to find a wife who will devote herself to taking care of him quite recently a paragraph has appeared in the oldchester newspaper announcing the probability of a marriage between our distinguished townsman mr theodore bransby whose career at the bar is being watched with pride and pleasure in his native city and the lady euphemia haggistown daughter of the earl of caldkale etc 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 lady euphemia is a faded timid gentlewoman of some five or six and thirty years of age with neither money nor beauty she is sometimes haunted by the ghost of a romantic attachment to a penniless young navy officer lost at sea hard upon twenty years ago but she has a soft submissive desire to win the kindly regard of the remarkably stiff and cold young gentleman whom her father has decided she is to marry whenever he shall see fit to ask her but poor lady effie does not succeed in softening the implacable correctness of her suitor's demeanour into anything very humanly sympathetic theodore is quite certain to make the most of his wife's title and social standing in dealing with the world in general but it is to be feared that he may think fit to balance matters by tyrannizing over her in private with some rigour mrs dormer smith often moralizes her family history entangling herself in many metaphysical knots in the course of her cogitations as to what would have happened if something else had happened which never did happen of course if poor dear augustus had not thrown himself away on susan dobbs things would have been very different but even in spite of that much might have been retrieved had he not made a second and still more shocking mesalliance with a strolling italian singer because probably if augustus had come home after the death of his cousin lucius in a proper spirit and under not discreditable circumstances and had conducted himself so as to conciliate his uncle the old man would never have thought of marrying again constance hadlow would never have become viscountess castlecombe and no heir would have appeared to thrust augustus from his inheritance 
there was an ever-recurring difficulty in fixing the exact point at which poor dear augustus's misfortunes had become irretrievable so that although pauline was on perfectly civil terms with the castlecombes and although frederick was asked down to combe park for the shooting every season and although my lady was happy to receive the dormer smiths with the least little indefinable touch of condescension whenever she was at her house in town yet in her confidential moments pauline's intimate friends were never quite sure which of the three momentous alliances she was alluding to when she talked plaintively of that unfortunate marriage End of chapter 14 End of That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope